very glad to be here today to share with you some of my personal experience and also kind of an outlook on how this uh, whole revolution started and how it developed and where it's going and uh, all the fun little things in between, <laughs> like taking down state security. <laughs> um, I'll just let you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. I uh, studied at the American University in Cairo and political I'm just recently graduated in political science, uh, actually in December, then the revolution started, so it was <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. It was perfect. But, I mean, I was running with my professor at the revolution, which was great. <laughs> um, but I have been a, an activist in Egypt for a while, and especially last year, uh, we, Egypt has witnessed the highest number of records of protests and sit-ins and strikes and we even had at my university a worker strike. It wasn't even a student -like strike, but the cleaning workers went on a five-day strike that the uh, professors and the student closely worked together to uh, build solidarity and so on. Um, but this revolution has definitely uh, started a long time ago. Uh, about 10 years ago with the second Palestinian Intifada in 2000. That inspired a lot of people to take to the streets uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians and in a kind of an anti-imperialist uh, sentiment. That developed over the years with the invasion uh, of Iraq, with the US invasion of Iraq. Uh, people occupied then in 2003, Tahrir Square, it wasn't without many people and it wasn't obviously for days, but people had started to mobilize, coming up with the uh, Kifaya movement in 2004 that was um, initially and, and foremostly it was uh, against the Mubarak regime still being in power and running for another term uh, in 2005. That was obviously um, <coughs> dealt with brutally through the police, uh, even women getting sexually harassed in the protests in 2004-2005. When Mubarak won the, the rigged, very rigged uh, elections in 2005, that didn't stop. It did continue, but in different forms. Egypt has witnessed um, a new liberal, economic liberalization uh, agenda since the 90s, but it was completely executed in the past uh, few years, starting in 2006, that raised uh, a lot of privatization um, policies practiced in huge sectors in the economy uh, pushed further a labor movement that was already uh, kind of there but not mobilizing in that sense so labor were striking in factories in mass numbers and that spread by one factory going on strike another factory going on another strike, calling for the same demands the workers were calling for in like Khafr al war and then in Mahalla and so on. Until 2008 when we had the Mahalla Intifada, uh, the workers had called for a strike on April 6th, but actually the strike never took place because the Central Security Forces occupied the textile mill, which is the largest textile mill in the whole Middle East. Uh, it's about 27,000 workers. Uh, when when that happened, the whole town of Mahalla erupted <coughs> in a small revolution that was countered by violence. And if you have looked at any footage or pictures from that um, time, it looked a lot like Gaza, and it looked a lot like that uh, the uh, January 25th revolution. So, like I said, in 2010. Uh, after that, after the two, you know, 2008 uh, leading up to 2010, lots of mobilization from a spectrum of causes, whether it be political, social, economical, uh, against torture, against police brutality, censorship uh, of press, um, you name it, someone was mobilizing for something. A group uh, was mobilizing for something until last year with the icing on the tape cake, really, uh, which was the rigged and circus parliamentary election that just proved there is no possible way of change other than an uprise. 
um, people who believed in the reform and if we all go to vote and our vote will count, well clearly that was disqualified after the January, uh, the parliamentary election in, in October of 2010. Leading up to January 25th, there has been a lot of mobilization um, for a number of, of things that particularly took place in just 2010, uh, including high inflation and prices. People were, you know, getting paid, are, are still getting paid really, uh, about 200 Egyptian pounds a month, and that's actually quite okay for, some, for someone. Some people got even paid 99 pounds a month. And the kilo of tomato at that time was 10 pounds. <laughs> so you can imagine living in this kind of, um, on that kind of wage was impossible. So there was a huge campaign for a minimum wage that is uh, 1,200, which would put you only on a, the poverty line. So it wasn't even something uh, beyond the limits or um, Ima unimaginable. It was very reasonable, and the state, obviously, you know, didn't um, didn't even react to it. Didn't even respond to it. Uh, there was a court case for this minimum wage issue that was ruled in favor of uh, or for setting a reasonable minimum wage that ties wages to prices to the high uh, prices, but that was never implemented. You got torture cases that ended with death at the hands of police, like the young uh, man Khalid Saeed, who was uh, tortured, beaten, arrested under the emergency law, and that moved a lot of people. That was in June, um, May, <coughs> June of, of the summer. Uh, workers were occupying Parliament Road. <laughs> I mean, they were striking, uh, asking for all kinds of, uh, uh, of demands, including minimum wage, uh, formation of independent unions that aren't corrupted and run by the states, because that's what our unions really stand for. Uh, we only have one independent union of uh, the real estate tax collector that was set up in 2008, and uh, that includes about 55,000 workers. But other than that, really, all the unions are corrupt and state-run. Um, You've got a sectarian issue that was boiling up, uh, starting you know long time ago. But the state uh, of how they dealt with this very sensitive issue uh, showed that they're incapable of sol solving it. Highlighting that was the Alex Alexa uh, Alexandria Church explosion that we had earlier this year, and the solidarity and the amount of mobilization that happened, that was faced by brutal force by the police. Um, angered a lot of people and made it escalate it even further. And that was just days before really um, uh, Tunisia, uh, Ben Ali stepped down. So when activists and, and opposition and movement was watching closely uh, what was happening in Tunisia, and as soon as Ben Ali stepped down, we knew that this is our opportunity to build on that momentum and protest and mobilize uh, to draw the parallel between Tunisia was able to do it, we can do it as well. We called for different protests and then we started coordinating all the youth movements, we started coordinating to uh, call for mass strikes, uh, um, not mass strikes, mass protests on January 25th, not knowing that it would turn into a revolution, but we started using mechanisms that we haven't used before, like um, calling for mass demonstration going from urban poor areas into uh, marching into a main common place like Tahrir Square. For <laughs> calling for that, we never believed that it was possible. There were many times in the past that we called for protests in Tahrir Square that never took place because the police had already shut it down, cordoned it off, or people would even get arrested going to Tahrir Square. Uh, but that was that was something that we were hoping for, but not worrying about. We're like, just let, I mean, the meetings, I, I wish I could draw you a picture of the meetings before the January 25th when we were sitting in a room discussing how we're going to go, what chance are we going to do, what time we're going to start it. And the consensus was, let's just start at, 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 at 
you know, urban poor areas, um, and hopefully, hopefully, when and if we get to Tahrir, we'll figure it out. <laughs> that was the plan. <laughs> and this is exactly what happened. When we got to Tahrir Square, it was like a magical moment. We, we, everybody was as, lev as revolutionary. It was definitely our moment to take charge of it to huddle, you know, and, and plan and, and see what is the next step. And the next step was that we we met under this tree at 7 p.m. We just called for a meeting. Um, but the people had already started chanting the people who want the removal of regime. Calling for the protest, the highest demand that we wanted was to detain the interior uh, minister, the, ministry of, uh, the minister of interior. That was our highest hope. And then the masses that came out, who never came out before, were actually chanting to take out Mubarak. <laughs> so in that meeting, I remember, you know, the, the, the young people there, they were like, including myself, uh, we, we were like, we need to take down, this has to be one of our demands. It has to be to take down Mubarak. And the older people who have been in the movement for decades, they were like, okay, well, don't let, don't let the ambition take you so far. <laughs> don't, don't um, come on. I mean, let's think about this. What we're asking for, but that was the moment where the masses had already decided where this was gonna go, and it was going down that road of we're not going back. We're gonna take him out. We're striking in Tahrir until Mubarak leaves, and that was that. So we wrote it down. I along with three other people, we had to sneak out of Tahrir Square, go make thousands of copies, bring it back in our bags, <laughs> stuff our bags, go one by one, make sure not to get arrested, and spread it in the entire square. And that night, we didn't stay in Tahrir because Tahrir was emptied by force, by rubber bullets, by tear gas, <laughs> by water cannon, everything that you can uh, think of. But the people didn't stop. They were running in side streets, and they were gathering and they were marching and chanting the same chants they did all day in Tahrir. And from that point on, nothing was coordinated between the groups who called out for the mass protest. Um, it wasn't definitely uh, led by any particular person, but it was all spontaneous, self-organized, and, and it gained momentum day by day, uh, especially with the state uh, responding in a very brutal way, like cutting down the communications. Uh, first thing, they cut the Twitter, and then we used a proxy. So they cut the internet, then uh, uh, we used phones, they cut the phones. Uh, so January 28th really was no communication whatsoever, and the amount of people on the street were more than ever before. It was a sea of people, if you can imagine that moment. Uh, my eye couldn't get the end of basically the march of how much and how um, people were determined that this is it, knowing that we were faced by brutal force, by everything that you can think of. Um, it kept gaining momentum and, and we went to Tahrir, the police disappeared, the army went in. Army didn't do anything. They were just spectators. People were shooting, uh, like between the police and and the uh, protesters. Were there were confrontations and clashes, but the army was pretty much not doing anything. Um, and the day when the camels and the horses and the thugs raided uh, Tahrir Square, that was probably the scariest moment of our revolution. We were outnumbered. We didn't have anything to uh, defend ourselves, and. They had weapons, they had swords, they had machine guns, they were um, throwing, you know, cocktail, <laughs> Molotov cocktails, and people were dying. But that didn't stop people. The fear was gone, there was a battle that we had to push for, there was uh, no going back at that point. And the solidarity we gained because of that day was immense. The next day, it just, people were more persistent, were more determined, more than ever. And the day Mubarak stepped down um, was something I hope